Today I'm going to be talking about uh, a research project that I'm just now beginning to fully flesh out. Uh, it's called, it's focused on, on Han folks that live in northwest China in a province called Xinjiang and, and their role in the a human engineering project that's targeting Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other Turkic minority peoples in, in northwest China. And so the title of my talk today is The Banality of Uyghur Unfreedom. Um, and, and I've published a, a bit of this work already in a, in a China file piece that came out uh, last month. And so I'm going to start by just reading a little bit of, of the introduction to that piece, um, to just give you a sense of, of how I'm thinking about it and, and what's actually happening on the, on the ground. So I'm going to start by talking about a group of people that I call the relatives. Often the big brothers and sisters arrived dressed in hiking gear. They appeared in the villages in groups, their backpacks bulging, their luggage crammed with electric water kettles, rice cookers, and other useful gifts for their hosts. They were far from home and plainly a bit uncomfortable, reluctant to rough it such a long way from the comforts of the city. But these relatives, as they've been told to call themselves, were on a mission. So they held their heads up high when they entered the Uyghur houses and announced they had come to stay. The village children spotted the outsiders quickly. They heard their attempted greetings in the local language saw the gleaming Chinese flags and round face of Xi Jinping pinned to their chests and knew just how to respond. I love China, the children shouted urgently. So what I'm talking about here is a group of people that have been sent from urban locations in northern China, or northern Xinjiang, this province in, in northwest China, and some from other parts of China. And have, they've been sent to rural areas to, to visit Uyghurs. Um, so just for those of you who don't know who the Uyghurs are, the Uyghurs are a group of around 11 million people in northwest China. Uyghurs entered the historical record around the 9th century when a, a population of people known as Uyghurs came from what's present-day Mongolia to this part of present-day China. They settled in oasis um, spaces along the, the Taklamakan Desert in the, in the bottom reaches of the Tian Shan Mountains. Uh, Uyghurs are a Turkic Muslim group. They've been Muslim for over a, a thousand years. Um, and they're quite closely related to Central Asian groups across the border, to Uzbeks, to Kyrgyz, to Kazakhs. The language they speak is maybe 95% the same as Uzbek. Um, it's really just variations in, in uh, lexicon in terms of difference of language between Uzbek and Uyghur. Modern Turkish is also quite similar, and, and Uyghurs see themselves as a Turkic people and, and as related to um, Turkic peoples elsewhere. And this is part of the issue that China has with Uyghurs, is that they have these affinities to other places. Uyghurs had their own state in the 1940s called East Turkestan, um, and that has been in the background of the politics of the region for a long time, that Uyghurs want to have their own state, East Turkestan or Uyghurstan. Um, and the Chinese state wants to prevent them from, from doing that. For a long period of time, Uyghurs had their own uh, autonomy. Even after the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, Uyghurs lived in, in a, a good deal of isolation in the southern part of the province, which is where those oasis cities are located. I guess you can see that from the map. Um, there, in 1949, the state began a process of moving Han settlers to the region, but most of those people were relocated in Bingtuan or uh, kind of military farming communities up here along the northern border to secure the border against what was seen as a threat of the Soviet Union. Uyghurs that lived in the south lived uh, somewhat autonomously. Um, of course, the state was still involved in their social organization in, in terms of, um, of, of how they should uh, structure social life. Um, socialism was implemented in the south as well. But Uyghurs, in many cases, didn't encounter people from outside in those spaces. That began to change in the 1990s and 2000s when large populations of people from other parts of China, which is being shown on this map here, moved into the region for other purposes beyond securing the borderlands to develop economic resources in the region. Um, this region is home to 21% of China's natural gas and gas reserves and, and oil is, is a, a large percentage of oil comes from this province. So, so when these people arrived, they began to build up the hard infrastructure that was necessary to extract those resources. They built pipelines, roads, highways, 
of railroads. They also began to introduce large-scale industrial agriculture, cotton farming, tomato farming. Um, today, around 38% of China's cotton comes from this province. And this had a, had a strong effect on the Uyghurs because for the first time, large populations of people began to move into their, their towns, into oasis cities in the south. Um, most Uyghurs were excluded from participating in these new industries. They weren't invited to, to become part of the oil or natural gas industries or even in the construction business. Um, instead, people from other parts of China were, were um, pulled into those companies. Um, utilizing guanxi networks, networks of, of affiliation between uh, in, in local places elsewhere in China, people were given jobs in this new, new uh, frontier, uh, which is really how you could translate the term Xinjiang. So this had the effect of making Uyghurs feel as though they were being dispossessed, and not just feel that they actually were being dispossessed in many cases of their land. They were being pushed from, from lands where they had been living um, to make way for these new developments. It also, though, had a, a more structural economic impact in the fact, in the, in the way that it, it, it increased the cost of living because there's so many new people living in, in the province that are able to buy goods at a higher price. Basic staples, the price of them began to rise. Um, and, and because Uyghurs were excluded from these new jobs, the, the relational kind of poverty that they felt began to increase. They began to feel themselves becoming impoverished. Um, so all of this bred a lot of discontentment among Uyghurs, and that's why we began to see cycles of violence. Uyghurs protesting, the police, the state responding to those protests, um, and then in response to those responses, Uyghurs protesting further. Um, there was lots of police brutality um, in terms of people being shot on the street or being detained um, unjustly. And so a lot of the, the feelings of lack that Uyghurs began to felt, feel became, began to be expressed in violent ways. Um, many of those incidents of violence that we associate with Uyghurs were not motivated by ideology. Um, they were not connected to global forms of, of political Islam necessarily, but instead direct responses to feelings of lack in their own in their own communities, people being taken from them. If your father or brother is taken from your family, um, you feel as though you need to respond in some way, and, and that's how violence began to, to emerge. In response to that, the state introduced new forms of policing. Um, they increased the budget for security forces by over 1,000% um, in, in, in just a 10 years, between 2007 and 2017. They hired over 100,000 new police officers. They introduced new forms of surveillance, new forms of, um, of hard infrastructure of control, checkpoints. And today the police density is probably equal to or higher than police density in East Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so that was the initial approach. The way of trying to contain this discontentment was policing. That began to shift in 2017 when a new party secretary named Chen Chuangbo, who was coming from Tibet, introduced a new approach to this problem. And maybe it wasn't only Chen Chuangbo, it's also coming from Xi Jinping and the central party leadership. Um, they, they said that they wanted to move from this containment approach, security approach, to a transformation approach, to actually transforming the population. And so to begin this process, they introduced a, a, a global assessment of the population. So this meant that they um, asked local police, those that had been hired recently, to go into people's homes and assess them based on these 10 categories. Um, so is the person of military age between the age of 15 and 55? Are they ethnic Uyghur? Um, are they unemployed or underemployed? Do they possess a passport? Do they pray regularly, which means five times a day? Um, do they? have religious knowledge, which means have they listened to unauthorized messages on their phones in the past? Um, smartphones had just recently come into the province and 3G networks. Um, so people had been using smartphones a lot to learn about Islam. And that became a major point that they used as evidence to, to decide whether or not someone was an extremist or a radical in, in any way. Um, so religious knowledge. Did they Also, did they learn Arabic in the past? Um, that was something that they were really concerned with. Um, did the, had the person lived, visited one of 26 banned or flagged countries, Muslim-majority countries such as Central Asian republics, 
Turkey, Egypt, Malaysia, Dubai, those, those sorts of areas. Um, had the person overstayed a visa while traveling abroad? Did they have an immediate relative in a foreign country? And have they taught their children about Islam in their home? All of these, these modes of assessment were, were then used to determine whether the person was safe, unsafe, or normal. Um, and since three of these categories, fifth, the, the age, ethnicity, and employment status was something that m applied to most people, the, in, the, in the Uyghur category at least, um, as Uyghurs are, uh, the population is quite young um, and, and unemployed. Um, since those three categories already to applied to them, it was quite easy for people to move from a normal or uh, a safe category into the unsafe category. Um, you really just had to have practiced Islam uh, a bit or visited a country outside of, um, outside of, the, um, outside of China, uh, especially one of these 26 countries. Um, and, and that would throw you into the unsafe category. So through this mode of assessment, around 10% of the total population of Uyghurs were sent to re-education camps. Um, that's over a, a million people. Um, many of them were detained because of past cyber crimes or cyber mistakes, passing messages about Islam in the past, um, small things that they could track using uh, the new surveillance technology that people had done in the past, over the past several years. Um, millions more were forced to attend regular transformation through education activities in their villages, um, which is something that's normal now. In, in rural life, people are always being, thought, uh, being trained to, to, to do more political education. Um, and in order to facilitate that, around one million people were sent to the countryside to monitor and, and get these activities going, make sure that they're happening. And that's really what I'm going to be focusing on uh, for, for most of this talk is, is that aspect of it. The people that are not in the camps but could be sent to the camps and that are in this process of being re-educated outside of the camps. So, but before I get there, I, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the camps in case you haven't been following the news or, or don't know. Uh, there's around 180 of these concentration through re-education camps and concentration is used in the word, in the, in the naming of these camps at times. Um, the state also talks about them as being vocational training centers. Um, the naming has changed over time as, this, as Western media has, has begun to discuss them. Um, but this is one of the camps uh, as it was about a year ago, close to Urumqi, one of the largest camps. It's since doubled in size, um, but there's an aircraft carrier up there just to show you kind of the scale. Um, it's now the estimate of, of the number that could be contained in this camp is around 130,000 people, which makes it by far the largest prison in the world. Um, although we don't know with certainty that it's at capacity or, or not. Um, though we have heard reports of people that have been released from camps that, that there's conditions of overcrowding in many of them. Um, and so it's, it's likely that it is close to capacity um, in terms of the number of people held. This is what uh, in, life looks like inside the camps. This is at a camp in Lop, which is down close to Hoten. Um, there's variation in terms of how people are treated in the camps, what kind of activities they have. In general, they are medium security prisons. People are held in, in uh, dormitories. Uh, so there's groups of people that are held together and they rotate from dormitory to dormitory so that people can't uh, form associations, relationships with each other. Um, in some cases, people are instructed to wake at 6 a.m., make their beds, go out and raise the flag, sing the national anthem, sing red songs, and then begin political education. Um, and in the afternoons, they're often asked to uh, perform kind of struggle sessions where they stand and, uh, in front of the, the other inmates or detainees and they um, talk about what they did in the past, the crimes they committed in the past, such as you know, studying the Quran or something. Um, and denouncing that past activity, admitting that they were wrong, um, and then asking kind of for forgiveness. And then other people in the audience are, are meant to criticize them. Uh, performing these tasks well um, gives them points towards eventual release, or at least that's how it's discussed. Um, in other cases, though, we've heard that 
that the camps um, actually function more like human warehousing um, spaces, mm -hmm. where the education systems that are put in place are really not effective in, in any way. Um, in some cases, people are simply held in their, their dorm room uh, for most of the day. Maybe they're allowed out for, for meals. Um, but the learning that happens, happens in the dorm room uh, with distance learning um, uh, technology. Um, so there's a, a monitor in the room that, that will show a speech and then they, they're given you know, pen and paper and they're supposed to take notes and, and learn um, the, the political teaching through that sort of distance learning technology. It seems to be universal in all of the camps is that there's uh, closed circuit cameras that monitor people. Um, and so to, to get permission to go to the bathroom or, or, or do anything, you have to raise your hand and then you'll hear over the intercom that you have permission to go or to speak. Um, <coughs> people are not permitted to speak to each other kind of out of the corner of their mouth um, without directly speaking to the camera. Um, so if you, if you talk to a, another detainee and you're caught, um, you can be punished. These are things that we've heard from, from people that have been released. Uh, the majority of people that have been released have been Kazakhstani citizens, Kazakhs, um, that were detained kind of accidentally. And then because the Kazakhstani government uh, intervened, they were released and now they're in Kazakhstan. And so they have a bit of freedom to speak. Um, those that don't perform well in the re-education activities, the struggle sessions are often punished. Um, placed in isolation, solitary confinement. Um, at times, they're beaten, placed in stress positions. Um, and we've heard reports of people being forced to eat pork and other things that would violate Islamic practice. So that's just a little bit about the camps. For those of you that don't know we can, about them, we can, we can speak more about them if you, if you have more questions at the end of the talk. Um, but what I want to focus on now is, is those that aren't in the camps yet. People that are um, people that are in villages, um, but are afraid of being sent to the camps, and also the role of Han civilians in kind of giving this this program uh, its forward movement, facilitating it, um, the kind of everyday life of deciding who gets to go to the camps and, and who doesn't. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of a video just so you can hear in their own words and see a little bit what that looks like when these Han civilians, which are, there's over a million of them, have been sent to the rural areas, uh, what that looks like and how they talk about that, that process. Oh, I guess we don't have sound, um, which is fine. It's just ominous music. So. <laughs> So these are the kind of activities that are going on in the camps, or outside of the camps in the villages. And this is from state sources, the, the kind of propaganda that they have around this, these visits. All right, so you begin to see some of the themes that emerge in how people represent these visits, um, that they see themselves as doing good, um, they feel anxiety at first, but then they see that they're being so warmly embraced, and so they think, oh yeah, this is really working. Um, and they also see Uyghur villagers thanking them for, for doing this work. Um, okay. Okay, so the relatives, the folks that you saw in those videos, they came in three waves. It, it first began in 2014 when 200,000 party members were sent uh, as part of a program that they called Visit the People, Benefit the People, Bring Together the Hearts of the People. 
Um, and this, this initial push sending people that are employed in Donways in the city, um, Donways are companies like institutions ranging from, from universities to banks to you know, the public utilities people, um, forestry services, everyone had to send someone, send uh, volunteers is what they called them, um, to, to do this work. And, and these people were, were sent to support local officials, to kind of monitor the local officials and make sure the local officials were doing a, a good job in terms of monitoring um, the local people and cracking down on the three forces, which they call, which is, is how they refer to um, terrorism, extremism, and separatism, the, the three bad forces that need to be, be uh, stamped out. So this began in 2014, which was uh, the beginning of the People's War on Terror in response to uh, incidents of violence in Kunming, Beijing, and in Urumqi, where there, there were things that appeared to be uh, political Islamic uh, actions of violence against Chinese civilians. Um, this was a response to that. In 2016, we saw a second wave of civil servants sent to the countryside in a new program called United as One Family. Um, and here, the, the point was to place people in relatives, as they call themselves, in the homes of Uyghurs, um, whose family members had been imprisoned or killed by the police. Um, so here, they're, that, was, that was a primary focus of what they're doing. They're, they're sending people to sensitive villages, villages where it was known that, that people had acted violently in the past, where they had protested state um, oppression in the past, or, or they had um, sent people to people that had, had gone to Kunming or other places to, to carry out violence, where those people had come from. Um, so 110,000 people were sent there. They, they were living also on a long-term basis in these villages, living for 90 days at a time, and then they would have a 10-day break to go back to their hometown um, before they were sent again for another 90 days. In 2017, there was a, a large expansion of this program, a million civilians sent to, to visit relatives in the villages. And here they, they focused more on the extended family of people that had been sent to the re-education camps, uh, because between 2016 and 17, they had drastically expanded that, that re-education camp system, and they had sent such a large number of people to the countryside and uh, to, the, to the camps, and so they were worried that the villagers that were not in the camps would revolt, um, and that they would uh, move more towards um, an extremist position. So today, um, following up the publication of this article, the, the People's uh, Daily in China, um, confirmed that what I said was true, and they've said now that 1.69 million Turkic Muslims, mostly Uyghurs, have been paired with these relatives. Um, and that 1.1 million relatives are visiting them on a regular basis. So what do the relative visits look like? Well, when they, they arrive, um, they get paired with their relatives. The, the, the Han people meet their hosts. Their hosts have been assigned a relative. Um, they have no choice but to accept them into their home. Um, and they pretty quickly begin a, a series of assessments. So the, the relatives that are sent from, from urban locations to the countryside have a manual that they carry with them at least in some cases. I've, I've seen one of these manuals that was used in Kashgar Prefecture. Um, and these are the types of questions that the manual tells them to uh, answer or to think about as they're encountering the family for the first time. They say, when you enter the home, do the, when you enter the household, do the family members appear flustered or use evasive language? Are there any strange outsiders in the family who have not been registered with the village committee? Are there any parked cars or car batteries that do not belong to the family? Are there any household items that are obviously inconsistent with the family's economic income and living standards? Are there any knives, axes, or cleavers that are not, not necessary for daily use? Any gasoline? Any alcohol, matches, paint thinner, liquefied gas, and small cylinders? Um, and then it moves to cultural considerations or religious considerations. Do they watch TV? Do they not watch TV programs at home and instead only watch VCD discs? Um, are there any religious items still hanging on the walls of the house? And then the last, last thing that they should do is play with the children. The children will not lie. Um, which kind of tells you the, some of the direction in how all of this works. So, so there's an interest here we can see in this, in this listing of things that could lead towards violent action. That's something that they're concerned with. But they're also concerned with whether or not the people are religious. Uh, if they are 
um, have any kind of attachments that they're still holding on to when it comes to religious practice, um, and how well integrated or interested they are in national programs, patriotic education, um, those sorts of things. So watching TV at home is an important way of demonstrating that you're not a separatist, you're not religious, um, you're on board with the Chinese program. Um, the, the play with the children thing, uh, I think is, as it says, the, the children will not lie. They're going to actually tell you the truth, and so you should give them candy and, and become their friends. Uh, but it also is telling us something about the linguistic issues that are happening in these visits, because most of the Uyghur villagers that they're visiting don't speak Chinese well, um, but the children are being trained now in Mandarin medium schools, so the children are going to be the ones that are doing a lot of the translation and telling the, telling the visitors what's actually happening in the family. Um, so the children are an important aspect of all of this. So some of the other questions that people might ask, and this is based on my conversations that I had with uh, people when I was there in, in April, um, are things like this. Like you're, you would ask or, or observe whether or not your Uyghur hosts uh, greet their neighbors using Arabic, uh, using the words assalamu alaikum. Uh, you, you try to find out if there's a Quran in the home, if people are going to pray on Friday, if they're fasting during Ramadan. Um, if the little sister's dress is too long or the, or the little brother's beard is irregular, too long again. Um, if they have any relatives living in sensitive areas or living abroad. If they have any knowledge of Arabic or Turkish. They've attended a mosque outside the village. Um, if the ch <coughs> children are speaking Chinese at home, that's something you should observe and, and should be happening. And, and also Chinese music and TV are those things that, that uh, people have interest in. Of course, these questions are not going to necessarily produce the, the final truth of the situation. That's why they need an extended period of time in the home, over a week, um, to really observe and participate in family life and see if anyone slips up um, through that process. Um, but they also enact a number of tests to, to make sure that, that these people tr truly are secular, truly are wanting to be patriotic. Um, so one of the things that they do is they ask specifically, um, about whether or not people smoke or drink, and then they, they actually bring liquor with them, bring cigarettes with them, and offer them to their hosts, um, and make sure that they drink and smoke together, and, and just observe how eager they are to do those things. Um, this alcohol consumption is, in the past, just in, in 2014 and 15, when I did the bulk of my field work, was something that Uyghurs were not doing, at, were not drinking at all. It was seen as a violation of uh, Islamic piety, as haram. Um, and so now they're being asked to violate their Islamic practice in front of um, the visitors explicitly. They also often bring uh, food with them, and then it's, which is another way of testing whether or not the people will ask if it's halal or not, if it has pork in it or not. Um, many Uyghurs I've spoken to have said that you know, this experience of eating food that they don't know the source of, they don't know what meat is in it, is one of the most... Um, like, uh, psychologically damaging things they've done in their lives. Like they felt you know, sick physically doing, eating this food. Even though I think in many cases it's actually n not pork in, in the, in the uh, food that they're eating, because they don't know if it is or not and they're not permitted to ask, they have to just act as though it's you know, a wonderful gift that their, their um, visitors are bringing with them. Um, it, it puts them in a really difficult position. It makes them feel very uncomfortable. Um, and it's, it's also another test. So if someone asks if, if it's halal, then that would be a sign that they actually care about Islamic practice, even if they're saying otherwise that they don't. Okay, um, so just a little bit more about the assessments. Uh, in the manual that I, I, <coughs> I translated that was um, used in Kashgar Prefecture, the relatives were given in specific instructions on how to get their relatives to let down their guard. Um, and so that, they said that you should start by showing warmth showing that you care about them. Um, you know, get to know the kids, talk about the, the, the family's well-being, all these sorts of things. You shouldn't start lecturing right away, it said. Um, and it, but, but as you get to know them, it said that you should also tell them, tell the, the host, the, the Uyghur family, that, that, that you've been monitoring, the state has been monitoring all internet and cell phone communication that's coming from the family, and so they shouldn't even think about lying uh, when it comes to their knowledge of Islam and religious extremism. Um, so so the, the idea is to get them to start talking about it. Um, 
and, and make sure that they know that if they don't, they, there will be severe punishment. We sent to the camps. Um, of course, the, the Han relatives that are going into these spaces don't talk about the camps as camps, they talk about them as schools. Um, and so that's part of the slippage that's happening here in, in, in terms of how people are thinking about this in different ways. The Han folks that are volunteering to do this work or being forced to do this work think about them as schools where Uyghurs think about them as prisons. So following these assessments, people spend time together, but they, they, they reconvene as, as visitors, the relatives, um, in government offices and talk about what they've experienced in their homes, talk about whether or not what they've seen is examples of extremism or not. Um, they also, the manuals have spaces in that you should fill out, um, you know, writing down the answers to, the, to certain questions. And, and those things need to be digitized, and so they're they're uploaded into government databases, security databases, and become part of the file associated with the family members. Um, that's a, a big part of the labor, actually, is, is doing all of this paperwork. Another aspect of the visits is education, um, and, and assuring that education is happening, happening as the way it sh in, in the way it should. And a, a lot of this focus is on the children. So they want to make sure that the children are learning Chinese, um, and that their education contains the patriotic elements that it's supposed to about new, new China and also de-emphasizing differences as minorities. Uh, one of the things that they're making sure Uyghurs talk about when they refer to the national language is they don't call it Hanyu. Um, instead, they call it you know, Zhonglin or, or something like that, something that, that, that shows it to be the national language rather than the language of the Han. They also have um, parties that hop, happen on a regular basis. Um, during these visits, some of them are, are focused on Han cultural traditions, others on Uyghur cultural traditions. They're often thought of as harmony dance parties in Kanjia, meshreps in Uyghur. Um, and so you have a, a, a dance performance um, or uh, people dancing together. Um, also, this is another way of testing and making sure that the people are truly are secular because in 2014 and, and before, people were not dancing because it was seen, a, again, as haram, something that Muslims that are pious should not do. Um, the last part of this is there's a, a, a part of the education push is bringing new forms of civilization to the, the Uyghurs who are often talked about as being backward or uneducated. Um, and a lot of this has, has uh, they, they talk about it as being, they're bringing modern ideas to them. So one of the pushes in, in these visits was to, to teach the, the Uyghur hosts um, how to sleep on a bed, how to sit in a sofa chair, and how to eat at and study at uh, a table. Um, so it's like bringing modern ideas to these Uyghur households um, and making sure that they understand that this is a better or more convenient, more modern way of, of conducting their daily life. Um, Uyghurs, traditionally conduct a lot of their household uh, chores, household life on a, on a raised platform, kong in, in um, Chinese, supa in Uyghur. Um, and this is a move away from that towards modern forms of living. So some of the events that happened during these weeks of visits and, and and kind of on a regular basis is people being asked to go out and raise the Chinese flag and pledge loyalty to the Chinese state. So here you see uh, Uyghur villagers and Han um, visitors doing this activity together, pledging loyalty to the state. They also read through the most recent party, um, party publications. So after the 19th National Congress, um, they read through these types of uh, pamphlets. Um, I think it's likely that because this is quite high level Chinese and has a lot of jargon in it, that, that the villagers that are being taught these new doctrines don't completely understand what they're being taught. Um, but they're being trained to nod and act as though they do understand and to perform a kind of patriotism without a, a, a lot of understanding. A lot of what's being assessed is the attitudes of the Uyghurs. Some of the political training happens in, in a more uh, corporate or communal spaces. Some of it's distance learning, so you'll actually watch a video of a party official speaking about what's happening or what should be done. 
Um, one of the things that's interesting to note in a lot of the propaganda images associated with this is that many of the people in the audience are women, um, which indicates something about what's happening in the community. Many of the, of the men have been taken and have been, are now in the re-education camps. The, the sent down workers, the volunteers that are, are, are being sent to monitor uh, Uyghurs also go to the schools and make sure that the, in the schools Mandarin language is being used mm. and is the, the only medium of education in the schools. Um, they, could, they both monitor and they, I think, participate in this process. This is what one of the harmony dance parties looks like. You can see that there's a, an emphasis on, on inter-ethnic dancing uh, and also inter, uh, across gender lines so that men are dancing with women from, from another ethnicity. Um, this is another way I already said of, of testing whether or not people are, are, are truly on board with secular uh, living. They also have, in, in some of the, the documentation of, of what people have done in the villages, um, there's videos that are people are watching in the homes. Um, but the reason I, I brought this to this presentation was I wanted to show you that in this caption for this image, she says that she feels as though this elderly Uyghur man um, is just like her father, that she is just like his daughter, um, which is the way that people talk about this in terms of the Becoming One Family program is that there's real intimacy, real connection that's being uh, produced, um, and that, that they truly are becoming um, as one family. So this has something to do with the, the idea of, in the manuals and how they talk about it, of, of showing warmth, of documenting the way children are embracing the teaching that's being given to them, and the way Uyghur mothers are embracing or posing for pictures. Um, is also uh, part of the showing warmth aspect of this is, is giving gifts uh, to the local family. So you bring either basic staples um, or these kind of civilizational markers, so you know, a table or something, um, as a way of um, showing warmth, showing that you have compassion towards um, the people that are hosting you. So this is what a gift of rice and oil looks like. Um, this is a table that's been gifted to this family and, and then using the table for the first time. They also give gifts to the children, um, and, and there's usually a political purpose behind these gifts. So like in, in this image, the, the book that's being given is Woman to Zhongguo, uh, Our China, um, which is teaching this Uyghur kid how to identify with the nation as a whole, uh, rather than with his Uyghur uh, identity. Um, here's another example of, of showing warmth. And of course, sharing the same bed is something that's documented in many of, of the posts that, that the uh, civilian workers put online um, as a way of really demonstrating the intimacy uh, that's happening in these spaces. So what does this all mean? I'm gonna now kind of walk through some of the perspectives that are, are in play here. From the Uyghur perspective, um, this is experienced as a kind of violent paternalism. Uh, uh, a real imposition on their daily life and, and on family life. They see it as a process of having their spirit broken, um, both as autonomous individuals and as families and collectives. They see it in, as an assault on basic institutions of language, family, faith. Um, they see it as an, a, an attempt to eradicate embodied Islamic practice and ethnic pride among Uyghurs. From the state perspective, this is part of a process of producing something that they call long-term stability, which is the, or security, which is the kind of final goal, final solution that they, they have in mind for what they call the Xinjiang problem or the Uyghur problem. From Han perspectives, um, there's a variety of, per, of perspectives. It's complex from the Han perspective. Um, in general, though, they don't understand what's actually going on in the camps. Um, only one of the, the people I interviewed out of about a, a dozen really thought about these camps as prison spaces. The rest thought of them as educational centers. They thought about them as a form of punishment, but they thought about them still as education centers, that there's going to be a benefit that comes through this process for the people sent to the camps. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they don't understand what's going on. Um, primarily, though, it's, it's that the state isn't permitting them to understand it. So the, the state doesn't talk about it talk about it as camps or prisons. Um, it's, it's just not there in, in the media discourse. There's also, I think, though, a good deal of willful ignorance. 
um, on the part of, of Han folks in the region. Um, they maybe don't really want to know what's going on in those camps. From, for people that have lived in this province for a long time, people that refer to themselves as Lao Xinjiang or Ben Di Ren, local old, old Xinjiang, um, they see this as a process in which they have no choice but to accept. They, they have to take part in this process. Um, one of them told me that in the past, the phrase, where there's oppression, there's resistance, uh, might have rang, rang true, but now the phrase is, where there's um, oppression, there's submission. Um, they just are trying to keep their head down and make sure that nothing happens to themselves. People that have come to the province more recently, though, talked about this as a, a process of <coughs> producing security, which they thought as a, as a net good. Um, and they at times thought about it as you know, taking over this land of occupation and, and conquering. Um, and they seem to enjoy some of the privilege that came from having access to Uyghur spaces, being able to act, you know, walk into Uyghur neighborhoods, Uyghur homes, uh, without any fear of, of resistance to them, and also the, the sort of pandering that happens now um, in response to their presence. So from Uyghur perspectives, thinking through what's happening, they, they would talk about how the this is a process in which their families are being taken and their faith. And they said, we have nothing left. Uh, I'll just give you one example from one of the many Uyghurs I've spoken with, um, a, a man who I, this is a pseudonym, Alim. His older brother had visited Turkey um, some time before. And, um, and after returning, had been taken away and was now in the camps. And he said that his sister-in-law, he thinks, still acts a little bit defiant when the state workers come to her home. So he's worried, I worry that they will decide she needs to be re-educated too. And if that happens, her children will become wards of the state. Um, and this is the, what happens often when, when both parents are taken and sent to the camps. Um, it's not that the relatives are permitted to take care of those children. Instead, the children are sent to orphanages or you know, state um, schools um, and raised outside of the family structure. And so he was very worried that this would happen to his nephew. He said, uh, they want to take our children away from us. My nephew is eight years old. He's already being affected by this. He's quiet all the time now. And he said that the last time he saw a real smile on his nephew's face was when he opened a gift from, <coughs> from his father on his birthday. So they hadn't told this, this uh, young boy that his father was in the camps. So they just said he was away. He said, we told him that my father had sent, his leg sent him Legos from Beijing. Uh, we told him that his father is in, biz in Beijing on business, and he was so happy. Um, so we can see in this last quote that, that children are being affected in a, in a pretty dramatic way. They understand that something's not right. They might not know all of the complexity of what's happening, um, and, and the parents are trying to shield children from it, um, but it's still having a, a major effect on the children. So from people that have come to the province more recently, I found that a number of them were, were what I would call true believers in, in the process. They think that it's really working and it's necessary. They talked about the schools or these camps as, re, like, as if they were rehabilitation centers for drug users um, and that, that extremist ideology was, was, could be thought of as a disease that needed to be cured. Um, and so they, they just needed to eradicate the Islam part of Uyghur culture, Uyghur identity, um, and save the, the, the other aspects of the Uyghur person. Um, and so these, he said, and this is a quote, that these Uyghurs are being treated like drug addicts who are going through rehab. Um, and, th and then he echoed something that I heard from a number of people, um, that he'd heard that initially a number of Han workers were killed when they went to sensitive Uyghur villages. Uh, when women went for a walk after dinner, Uyghur men grabbed them and slit their throats. Um, and then he made like a slashing motion with his, with his throat, across his throat. Um, and he said that the state knows what's really going on. Um, there's a lot we ordinary people don't know about the seriousness of the terrorism problem. But what we do know, I think I'm missing something there, is something had to be done. Um, and continuing on, he said that these Uyghurs are just uneducated. It's not their fault that, that they began to practice extremist forms of Islam. They've been misled by hardened extremists. They don't know any better. 
And then he said, but the visits from the state, state workers and the camps themselves are really improving security. He said, now I've, I, I'm not even afraid when I enter a Uyghur village, things are, are much better now. Um, so from his perspective, this was really working. Um, he felt much safer um, going into Uyghur villages, Uyghur towns, uh, the atmosphere of fear that he had felt before that he's projecting, I think, onto Uyghurs um, was eliminated from his perspective. He could go anywhere he wanted. It's as though this, the space, the Uyghur space, had been opened up and made kind of clear for, for Uyghurs to, to move and act, or for Han people to move and act in. So from old Xinjiang Han perspectives, people that had lived in this province for a long time, there was a lot more ambivalence. Um, a lot of complaining. They felt um, that having to adjust to conditions in Uyghur and Kazakh villages um, was a big sacrifice. They said the work was boring and they missed the excitement of city life. Um, they mentioned probably most frequently that it, it felt inconvenient to be apart from their families. And they felt like they were sacrificing significant portions of their lives um, to be a part of this effort. They said that they uh, would have lost their jobs if they hadn't participated in the program, but that by participating in the program, they were guaranteed um, eventual promotions uh, within their Donway. So people that are you know, working as lawyers or doctors back in their home institutions, their home companies, um, were given pressure from higher ups that you have, to, you have to volunteer. If you don't, you'll be demoted. If you come back, you know, you'll get a promotion. Um, one of these uh, people from the old Xinjiang position told me that um, there's nothing we can do to protect Uyghurs, and so we just have to protect ourselves. And so they kind of gave up on any kind of pushback. Um, and then there was also fear that, that I felt from a number of them too, that, that, that they felt like the state had already gone too far in, in terms of cracking down on the Uyghurs. And they said that I don't know what will happen if we ever let the Uyghurs out. Um, and so they felt like if the Uyghurs are ever released from these camps, that there's going to be a real uh, up, uptick, uh, intensification of violence um, towards Han people, towards the state. Um, but there was a lot of ambivalence. It wasn't clear in, in, uh, in my interviews um, where people came out on this. In some ways, they, they felt like they were trying to push back, work within the system, and then in other ways, they, they still did kind of feel as though Maybe it is something we need to be a part of, um, and that there is going to be a, a good outcome that comes through this. So um, this woman I interviewed said that her father, who was a middle manager in a state-owned enterprise in Karamai, um, said he'd been forced into the assignment. Um, like I just mentioned, they're often given threats. If they don't, if they don't participate, they'll, they'll lose their job or, or be demoted. And he said that she said that her father had fought back to make the rules a bit more flexible uh, so as not to hurt the feelings of the Uyghurs that he was um, observing and monitoring. And she, she said that he was not a spy and he's trying his best. He lost 10 pounds last time I met him, saw him. And every day he, he told me how hard he finds his place to be. And yet he has, com he has to complete his daily job and try to comfort the families in a personal way. Um, and so there's sort of inevitability to this, a, a kind of a resigned resistance maybe that you could see here, but really a, a, a way of making do and, and, and staying within this position. Um, but when I really pushed her more about her father not being a spy, she did begin to tell me that, that, that Xinjiang had been the target of terrorism in the past and that in the poorer villages, uh, the terrorist ideolo ideology had been allowed to grow. Um, and she also began to talk about the education levels of the Uyghurs um, and that that was an aspect that had to be assessed when determining who should be sent to re-education schools or centers. Um, she said that those that had a difficult time blending into mainstream culture um, were those that should be sent either to re-education centers or to political education classes um, on the night or weekend. So she told me that that the ultimate goal that she saw that could come out of this, this process um, was that Xinjiang could become like another Yunnan, uh, which is in southwest China, where there's also a large number of minorities. 
She said that if it would be like that, it would be a space where people from outside the province are attracted to the province and those from the province are assimilated. So basically she's thinking it should just be assimilated. Uyghurs, Uyghurs should learn to speak Chinese. They should, um, the, the problematic aspects of their identity, these Muslim things that are, are, are um, seen as dangerous and that she sees as dangerous, um, those things should be eliminated and then uh, it would produce the kind of harmony that, that, that she wants and that she thinks the state wants. All right, to conclude, um, so the Relatives Program is a massive program, a million people. It's actually, you could think of it as a replacement for the million that have been taken to the camps. Um, and it, so there's this, uh, it's a sort of forced mixing that the state is, in, is uh, engaged in. It produces forms of monitoring and assessments, patriotic education, and inter-ethnic warmth. And that's how they talk about it. Um, but of course, this form of care does not extend to actual sympathy for these people whose family members have been taken to the camps. The manuals say explicitly, be careful not to sympathize um, with the Uyghur families um, or be brainwashed with them. It, it says, she not, it says, don't be brainwashed. Um, and I found in my interviews that it was really difficult for the majority of, of civil servants that I spoke with to place themselves in the position of the Uyghurs who they were um, visiting and whose lives and society they were involved in destroying. Um, they saw the type of violent paternalism that they were engaged in as necessary. It's like we need to take a strong stand and this is the way we're going to do it. Um, the state has said this is the right thing to do and so we're, we're, we're on board with it. Um, many of them believe that dominating all aspects of Uyghur life was the only way to move forward with the project of the Chinese nation. So, in order to produce secularism, modern society, this is what we had to do. Um, we have to break the spirit of these Uyghurs. So I'll just end with the, the conclusion to the article that I published. Um, what I see here is a, a form of banality, um, a kind of everydayness to this process. Um, it's normalized to a large extent, and so people don't see it as problematic. Um, So I'll just read this. The tyranny that is being realized in Northwest China pits groups of Chinese citizens against each other in a totalitarian process that seeks to dominate every aspect of life. It calls Han relatives into coercive relations with their Uyghur and Kazakh hosts, producing an epidemic of individualized isolation and loneliness as families, friends, and communities are pulled apart. As new levels of unfreedom are introduced, the project produces new standards of what counts as normal and banal. The relatives I spoke to who did the state's work of tearing families apart and sending them into the camp system saw themselves as simply doing their jobs. Citizens of totalitarian states are nearly always compelled to act in ways that deny their ethical obligations. In order for a grassroots politics of Han's civilian refusal of Chinese state oppression of Muslims to even be imaginable, what is taking place in Northwest China needs first to be accurately described. As Hannah Arendt observed decades ago, systems like this one work in part because those who participate in them are not permitted to think about what they're doing. Because they are not permitted to think about it, they are not able to fully imagine what life is like from the position of those whose lives they are destroying. So I'll just end there. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. <laughs>